Today is Thursday, March 30th, 2023, and here is the noteworthy news of the day. First, stunning information has come out about the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's bailout of Silicon Valley Bank depositors. As a background, we all know that the Silicon Valley Bank collapsed earlier this year, and the FDIC has a rule where it insures all bank depositors that are at or below $250,000 so that the entire financial system of the United States doesn't collapse when just one bank collapse. The argument is that by the FDIC insuring up to $250,000 of bank depositors, that they are not going to create panic that would otherwise ensue with a bank collapse. I like to draw this analogy where if you're on an airplane, let's say there are 300 people on an airplane, and all 300 of those people don't think that the airplane is going to take off. It doesn't matter if they think that plane is not going to take off. If the plane has the proper equipment, machinery, and competent pilots, that plane will take off whether or not the passengers think it will. The exact opposite is true of the economy. The economy only works if people have trust in banks and in the businesses that they are doing business with. So that is an argument for why the FDIC steps in to insure deposits at or below $250,000. But in the wake of the Silicon Valley bank collapse, President Biden announced that the FDIC would be insuring all of Silicon Valley Bank's depositors, even those that were above $250,000. And that constitutes the vast majority of, of SVB's bank depositors. 90% of the depositors had deposits that were over $250,000. So the FDIC chairman, Martin Grunberg, testified this week before the Senate and, as I indicated, revealed stunning information about the extent of this bailout. The FDIC has guaranteed $18 billion in uninsured deposits at the Silicon Valley Bank, and he said that $13 billion went to 10 accounts. That is stunning. 10 accounts got $13 billion out of the $18 billion that the FDIC put towards bailing out SVP depositors. President Biden has said that this FDIC bailout is not a taxpayer ba bailout, meaning the funds that FDIC is getting to uh, insure uninsured depositors are not coming from taxpayer collections. He says that rather the FDIC will charge higher fees that banks have to pay in order to belong to the FDIC. But if you think about it, where are banks going to get that money? to pay the higher fees to the FDIC. They're going to get it from their depositors. That's you and me who put our money in the bank. So even though President Biden is saying that it is not a taxpayer bailout, really in effect it is because we, the depositors, are taxpayers. Vivek Ramaswamy argued beautifully earlier this month that the FDIC should not have bailed out the Silicon Valley Bank because it creates a moral hazard. Now, of course, part of the problem here with what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank can't be entirely bl be blamed on the bank itself. Really, the primary issue was inflation. The Silicon Valley Bank handed out loans at low interest rates. And then as inflation has, has gotten even worse and the Fed has to increase interest rates, the Silicon Valley Bank, though they loaned at low interest rates, had to pay their depositors higher interest rates. So it created an uneven interest rate spread where the Silicon Valley Bank was losing money and wasn't able to pay back depositors. So yes, that is part of the issue. But really, most of what happened here is that the Silicon Valley bank was really poorly mismanaged. They pursued bad and irresponsible policies that led to this collapse. This inflation problem in our economy is the same for everyone. And what the Silicon Valley Bank did is that they took in too many depositors that they had to then pay high interest rates. And what they should have done, even though it's hard to turn away depositors, as in any business, you don't want to turn away potential clients or people who want to do business with you. But what they should have said is that we've taken on too many depositors, we have to pay out loans, and it's just not responsible for us to take in even more. But they didn't do that. 
Also, it has come out that the Silicon Valley Bank engaged in a lot of ESG, which is Environmental Social Governance Practices, in which they violated their fiduciary duty to protect their shareholders and depositors by not investing in funds that would be lucrative, but investing in funds that conform to woke diktats about environmental social governance. And more information has come out about the Silicon Valley Bank's board members. One was a uh, aide to President Obama. Several were Hillary donors, and one of them, <laughs> I'm laughing even though it's it's not funny because the Silicon Valley Bank collapse is going to har has harmed all of us. But this one Hillary donor who's on the board actually prayed at a Shinto shrine when Hillary lost to Donald Trump in 2016. Another member of this 12 member board is an improv actor. Doesn't seem particularly likely that an improv actor would be a good board member of a, a bank which has $200 billion in assets. And also SVB touted its diversity. They talked about the fact that 45% of their board was uh, comprised of women. They also had LGBTQ managers and members of the board, veterans working for them. So they really seemed to embrace this identity of uh, being um, progressive and woke instead of focusing on competence. Now, Bill Isaac, who is the former chairman of the FDIC, he served as the chairman in the early 1980s, wrote a great Wall Street Journal op-ed about this situation in which he argued that it is, quote, terribly unwise for the FDIC to put a 100% guarantee on SVP depositors because, as Vivek Ramaswamy also argued, it does create that moral hazard where banks are going to feel more comfortable participating in bad practices because they think the FDIC is going to bail them out. And also, on the other end, depositors are not going to vet the banks where they put their money in properly because they just figure, oh, well, even if I put it in this bank that doesn't work out, the government is going to bail uh, me out anyway. So what Mr. Isaac argued, and he, he drew from an example in which he was the chairman in the 80s, and this is what they did in the 80s, is that the FDIC should pay off uninsured depositors at 80% instead of at 100%. So Roku, which is of course that internet company, had $500 million in the Silicon Valley Bank. If the FDIC followed Bill Isaac's proposal, then Roku would get back $400 million of their money, but they would lose 20%. They would lose $100 million. And that seems to be a pretty good logical middle ground where it both, uh, prevents a panic from ensuing because w we need the FDIC to some extent to, to insure depositors, otherwise there is going to be that terrible panic which is going to lead to an economic collapse. But it also teaches a lesson because people are going to lose a significant chunk of their money. It teaches a lesson to the banks and it teaches a lesson to depositors to not engage in unwise business practices. Before we move on, I just want to say that this story of the FDIC bailing out the Silicon Valley Bank depositors, 13 billion of the $18 billion going to just 10 accounts, reminded me of a famous clip from the Oprah Winfrey show that seems to just synopsize the policies of our government. All right, open your boxes. Open your boxes, one, two, three. That's what our government is doing right now. You get a bailout, you get a bailout. Black Americans get reparations. Students get their student loans forgiven. Don't wanna work? No problem, get a stimulus check. And if you put all your money into a bad bank, the FDIC will bail you out. Again, seems like they all been watching reruns of the Oprah Winfrey Show. Speaking of government woes, on to our next news story. The IRS appears to have targeted journalist Matt Taibbi, which the House is investigating right now. For those who don't know, Matt Taibbi is a journalist, one of the journalists who Elon Musk, of course the owner of Twitter, enlisted to expose the Twitter files. Matt Taibbi did a masterful job exposing these files in which the previous ownership of Twitter worked with the federal government to censor conservative content on Twitter. He uncovered that the FBI wire transferred $3.4 million for unspecified reasons to Twitter. 
that members of the FBI met with Twitter execs on a weekly basis, that several former employees of the FBI went on to work at Twitter, including the FBI uh, gen former general counsel James Baker, who left the FBI to go to Twitter, and Mr. Baker was the Twitter employee who was single-handedly responsible for squashing the October 2020 Hunter Biden story just weeks before the presidential election. I mean, even just beyond what the FBI was, was doing with colluding with Twitter, Matt Taibbi uncovered that Twitter just internally was, was censoring and trying to downplay conservative tweets to tip the scales in favor of President Biden for the election. So really, he and the other journalists like Barry Weiss are heroes for what they have uncovered, and Michael Schellenberger, too, another hero. But Matt Taibbi announced that he received an unannounced visit to his New Jersey home from an IRS agent on March 9th. This was the same day that Mr. Taibbi testified before the Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. The, the House of Representatives, now that it is under GOP control, got rid of the January 6th committee that was investigating January 6th, and clearly, by the way, did an awful job because Tucker Carlson has showed that uh, some f of uh, the footage from that day, 40,000 hours actually of the footage from that day, was not shown to the American public, including footage which includes nine Capitol Police officers escorting the QAnon shaman, who was that guy with horns and fur, around the Capitol and letting him in to the Senate. Anyway. He, uh, Mr. Taibbi um, received this, this unannounced visit to his home the same day that he was testifying on this committee, which, which deals the House GOP has, has um, replaced the January 6th committee with, and it's the committee that investigates the weaponization of the government. So it's just astounding that he gets a visit, an unannounced visit from government officials on the same day that he's testifying about government weaponization. And IRS agents usually do not make unannounced visits to people's homes. When they want to launch an investigation or get information from someone, they often send a letter. So it's very uncommon for house visits to occur. The IRS allegedly told Matt Taibbi that his 2018 and 2021 tax returns had been rejected owing to concerns over identity theft. Again, why did this have to be a house visit? Could have just been a letter or a phone call. Mr. Taibbi has countered by showing proof that his 2008 tax returns were indeed accepted by the IRS. He said that he was never notified about this issue and that he didn't even know that it was an issue until the day that the IRS agent showed up to his home. The IRS also uh, initially rejected Mr. Taibbi's 2021 tax returns. Mr. Taibbi refiled according, he says, to the rules um, that, or the procedures, the new procedures that the IRS outlined for him. He refiled and then apparently the IRS rejected it again. And he says that the IRS owes him, quote, a considerable sum of money. The background here is that U.S. Congress before the midterms, so really while the uh, while the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress until January 1st, 2023, under that Congress, in coordination with the Biden administration, they agreed to give the IRS an $80 million push in funding to add 87,000 new IRS agents to the roster. Now, the stated purpose for this increase is to collect revenue. It's just plain old revenue enhancement. But given how the government has been politicized and weaponized, one cannot help but wonder whether the real purpose may be to target political opponents for audits and for harassment. I just told you about all of the collusion between the FBI and Twitter that was not exposed to the public until Matt Taibbi uh, uh, exposed it, but there are also so many other examples of government weaponization, specifically against people uh, with whom they disagree. Another prominent example was with Matt um, Hawke, who was a father who was praying in front of an abortion clinic at the end of 2022. And apparently he was violating um, some property laws by standing on that property and, and praying. Apparently there's a law that you can't pray in front of an abortion clinic. But instead of serving him with paperwork or making a phone call or God forbid, just letting it go because it's really not that grave of an offense, Merrick Garland's DOJ sent a 25 member SWAT team with assault rifles 
to his home where his wife and child was and arrested him. Did it need? Did he need to have 25, uh, a 25 member SWAT team sent to this guy's home? I mean, it seemed like it was just coercion and intimidation. Also, there was an internal member uh, memo that Kyle Serafin, who I interviewed recently on the show, a former FBI agent who has since been indefinitely suspended, released in which the FBI internally called Catholic Americans, quote, domestic terrorists. So again, we can't help but wonder, with all of this funding going to 87,000 new IRS agents, if the real purpose is just to collect revenue or if not to target uh, opponents. Also, really shady, according to this legislation, the IRS members, these new 87,000 members, would be armed and trained in firearms. Why do IRS agents need to be armed and trained in firearms? Also, aren't the Democrats the ones that are saying that we have a gun problem in this country and we need to demilitarize and get rid of people who have guns, but then they're trying to give it to the agents who are in charge of, of tax collection? Again, it really just speaks, unfortunately, to, it seems, coercion and intimidation. The House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan sent a letter Monday to IRS Commissioner Daniel Werfel and Treasury Secretary Janet Yelling speaking, seeking excuse me, an explanation for Matt Taibbi's unannounced IRS visit. Into our final news story of the day, former President Barack Obama has blamed former President Donald Trump for China's rise. Those of you who have been watching me know I talk all the time about China. China is eating our lunch, with which our President Joe Biden said that they would never do. He said, come on, man, really? They are pumping fentanyl into our borders. They are taking advantage of us economically, stealing our intellectual property. They have beat us with intercontinental ballistic missile launchers. They have outnumbered us in Navy and aircraft capabilities. They are spying on us, 120 million Americans through WeChat and TikTok. They are totally eating our lunch. Anyway, President Obama is not blaming that on, on himself or on President uh, Biden, but instead on President Trump. President, uh, President Obama excuse me, is on a speaking tour in Sydney, Australia this week where he is allegedly getting a million dollar payment. And he was talking with the Australian Foreign Affairs Minister, Julie Bishop. He said that Xi Jinping, the president of China, has a forceful and confident demeanor. President Obama continued, quote, with my successor coming in, I think Trump saw an opportunity because the U.S. president didn't seem, oh, excuse me, I think that Xi Jinping saw an opportunity because the U.S. president, Donald Trump, this is according to Barack Obama, quote, didn't seem to care that much about a rules-based international system. Obama also said of Xi Jinping, quote, and so as a consequence, I think that China's attitude as well, we can, was well, we can take advantage of what happens to be a vacuum internationally on a lot of these issues. So he's saying that China's rise is because of Donald Trump. Let's look at the facts though. Under President Trump, he slapped tariffs on Chinese goods for unfair trade practices. He also imposed severe penalties, such as travel restrictions and freezing uh, property in the United States for those Chinese officials who were specifically responsible for the massacre and genocide of the Uyghur population in China. And also, when China violated several territorial lines in the South China Sea during Trump's presidency, Donald Trump sent aircraft carriers to conduct joint naval exercises in the South China Sea and said that America will not stand for China's encroachments. And just, you know, another thing to note, President Trump, unlike our current president, is, was not bribed by Chinese officials. There are all of these emails that I talked about as recently as yesterday on the show between Chinese businessmen and the Biden family in which Joe Biden gets a cut for introductions in which a Chinese energy tycoon gave Hunter Biden a three carat diamond. I mean, it is just unbelievable that President Obama has the audacity to, br to blame President Trump who only pursued strong policies with regard to China, but then totally glosses over the fact that his vice presidential pick and our, our current president is compromised by China. Donald Trump also, even just not with regard to China, was very strong with foreign policy. Love him or hate him, there are reasons to love him, there are reasons to hate him, but one of the reasons to love him is foreign policy. He eliminated ISIS with just really in the first year in office. By the end of 2017, the year he was inaugurated, 95% of ISIS territory was eliminated. 
Also, he was very strong with regard to Putin and Russia. We should not forget that under President Bush, uh, Putin invaded the neighboring country of Georgia. Under President Obama, he invaded Crimea. And of course, under President Biden, Putin invaded Ukraine. Where did Putin invade under President Trump? The answer is nowhere, because Trump was very strong with Putin. Also, Donald Trump signed the Abraham Records, uh, establishing diplomatic relations with Israel and the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization, Egypt, Jordan, UAE, and Bahrain. And of course, President Trump also made us oil independent so that we wouldn't have to entreat to dictators like the Saudis, the Venezuelans, and the Iranians. This story just shows you that everything nowadays is upside down. Abnormal is normal. The, the mutilation of the healthy breast tissue of minors in the sake of quote unquote gender affirming care is not seen as abnormal, it's seen as normal. Illegal is legal. People who are in this country unlawfully, immigrants, are given driver's license as if they are lawful citizens of the United States. Failure is success. The President, uh, President Biden's withdrawal of Afghanistan in August of 21, 2021 was a disaster. The Taliban came back to, to uh, rule the country and, and hundreds of thousands of people were killed. But of course, he proclaimed that to be a success. And now in another stark inversion, President Obama is saying, no, it's not President Biden that has allowed China to eat our lunch. It's President Trump. There is just no sense of truth anymore. Politicians just think that they can gaslight the American people. Thanks for joining us today. And again, be sure to check out my timeless episodes on the timeless playlist page of this YouTube channel. And follow me at Julie R. Hartman. Take care.